It is Friday, May 21st. Let's talk PlayStation. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Happy Friday. As always, we will start with our PlayStation Plus reminder. So if you have not yet, make sure you head to the PS Store and grab these games before they go away. You do still have some time left there. And then also, if you remember last week, we were going over the final update for the Play Home Initiative, which was a list of games that are getting some free content items courtesy of Sony. Well, that content is now available. So if you owned any of those games that we talked about last week, then head to the PS Store and also grab that stuff as well before that expires on uh, June 7th, I believe. So make sure you grab that stuff as well. Now, for our first news story, let's talk about this. It's Returnal. Axios.com recently published uh, a very insightful article giving us some details on what's going on behind the scenes at Housemark on a number of fronts, like, for example, that highly requested save feature, the mid-run mid save feature, which a lot of people sorely need because if you've got a good build going, it could take three, four, five hours. That was what was so polarizing about launching this game is that Housemark didn't actually have anything in place here. So it's very evident that whatever they figure out, it's still going to be a few weeks out and... Judging on what they're saying right now, it still will be at minimum a few weeks out because they even just mentioned in this Axios article that they haven't decided on the best way to approach it just yet. And the reason why they're saying this is because they still want to avoid a situation where people can save scum the game, which is they can abuse the save feature. So if they lose their run at three, four, five hours in, they can reset it or restore a save file, right? They want to avoid that stuff. So they're still evaluating the best way to approach a mid run save system, basically. Uh, now, we're also being told that currently Housemark is working on new content updates and fixes, and they didn't elaborate too much on what new content could look like, but this is something where it didn't dawn on me until I finished the game, and I thought, oh yeah, Housemark actually, they have done a lot of DLC for their previous game, so that could be something that they do with Returnal, where it could be a new biome, we could see new rooms and enemy types for the existing biomes, and maybe an additional side room with a, a new boss in it or something like that could be really cool but this would also largely depend on the contract that they have with sony oftentimes with these you know second party deals or even you know traditional third party situations with some random independent developer and a big third party um there's a contract in place where it's only post game post launch support of like two three months just for patches and things like that and then they're not allowed to touch it after the fact or something but um who knows what situation is happening right here for this game but i would hope that there is more content that will be available possibly some premium content that they can really uh, go all, go all in on so that could be a, a very exciting prospect now moving on to our next news story ratchet and clank rift apart we're getting closer and closer to the release of this game which is great especially because sony's finally kicked on the marketing campaign for this game so they're spending a lot of time talking about it they're releasing new trailers insomniac is sharing new details and also on their official site, they released a list, a full list of all the accessibility options that will be available in Rift Apart. Now we saw a quick glance of this in the state of play that we got two weeks ago, but now we have a full list of all the accessibility options. And it's really, it's really awesome to see that Sony's really putting a big focus on this when it comes to their first party. Uh, all these fine tuned options that will be more specific to people with uh, particular needs, right? So that's what's great about having so many different toggles that you can mix and match between each other. So outside of the more standard stuff where it might apply to everybody, like inverting the X and Y axis or, you know, just standard difficulty settings or disabling tutorials because you might be familiar with playing Ratchet and Clank games, but you've got all these options where just it does, it opens it up to so many more people that might have struggled playing these particular games. It really depends on the nature of that game and how it was made and the genre that it is, right? I mean, that's what was so great about, say, the uh, the Xbox adaptive controller, which you can actually buy peripherals to make that playable on PlayStation 4s or PlayStation 5s even. Um, so there's just so much available right now to where it opens it up for a lot more folks that may have had a really tough time playing in this hobby and i, I just i like to see that uh, renewed focus and commitment from so many big players in the industry now this might be a good opportunity to segue into our next news story which is the last of us part two another game that also has a great range of accessibility options well recently this inherently playstation 4 only game just got a patch to unlock the frame rate on playstation 5 so this is something sony's been doing with a number of their first party games up to this point and it's this is one game where we were really looking forward to something happening there right and that's kind of what what the conversation has fallen to now where it's like hey what ps4 games need their frame rates unlocked what ps4 games would we love to see just have a full native ps5 port because that's kind of the situation where we find ourselves in right now uh, some games it's like yeah we're fine with unlocking the frame rate that way ps5 will just push it up to 60 and the game already looks quite nice as is 
and The Last of Us Part Two pretty much falls in that area for the most part. I mean, I think that's where we were a little bit curious as to how Naughty Dog would approach this particular situation because right now we know they're doing some kind of standalone factions, which who knows what that will look like still. Um, the cat's of the bag on this The Last of Us remake, which will look similar to part two, right? It will be a full-on remake. It's going to be it's going to look dramatically different compared to the game that we know from 2013 on PS3 and even that remaster on PS4. But with part two, where it was a very recent release, it was like, okay, that's got to come to PS5, but what, what does that look like? And at least for right now, we've got the unlocked uh, frame rate patch on PS4. So Digital Foundry already uh, had a look at it uh, early on. And yeah, you're, you're seeing great performance there. I already started a new save file myself and it's just buttery smooth. So much like Ghost of Tsushima, or um, Days Gone or God of War. The game looks gorgeous and plays, it feels so much better at that full 60 frames per second. Now, while we're on the topic of backwards compatibility and the performance you can see when playing through backwards compatibility, this is a great segue to our next news story, which is about uh, the game Biomutant. So this is coming out very soon for PS4, X1, previous generation machines, meaning that you can buy them, play them on current gen hardware through backwards compatibility. And the developer, Experiment 101, was very forward about what you can expect in terms of performance when playing through backwards compatibility, which we're seeing that on Series X, you're getting native 4K 60, but PlayStation 5, the developer is actually disabled 4k and they're doing 1080p upscale to 4k due to stability and performance concerns uh, also at 60 fps but that is something that they're doing for the ps5 version and they're being very forward about this and they're also letting people know that yes there is a native ps5 version coming eventually which you would assume that's when they can uh, tweak it to properly handle 4k 60 and then also handling or acknowledging the ssd uh, io throughput so that way the game has a fast boot time fast load times but for right now, as a PS4 game played on PS5, these are the short-term hiccups, and this is the developer's short-term solution. Now, this is a topic that we haven't talked about too much uh, lately, but we discussed it a lot prior to PS5 coming out and shortly after launch, which was how well backwards compatibility was for PS5 and even for Series X. And across the board, you've got amazing compatibility. You've got these consoles that are pushing higher frame rates, um, pushing higher dynamic resolutions, and that's great. But we are seeing some limitations on Sony's side, whereas we're not seeing the same on Microsoft's side. And we're learning that that's just purely due to how those games are made on previous gen hardware and well for microsoft with gdk that stretches across all those family of consoles so a developer can lead development on say an x1 game and that title can go above and beyond what an x1 game can do on x1 hardware if it knows it's being played on a series s and x which it would um when you're playing the game on that hardware. But for PlayStation, for the PlayStation side of things, right, the SDK is different. Uh, Sony requires a native port for a game to go above 60 FPS because PS4 games just cannot acknowledge that. That's why some games are 60 FPS through backwards compatibility, whereas on Xbox Series S and X, it can go up to 120. Um, and then we've got weird fringe example cases like this where, uh, keep in mind, Experiment 101 is a smaller team. We know PS5 can do native 4K 60 all day, every day some, for some very demanding games. So we know it's possible. I think this is really more of a case for this particular situation of a small team that just didn't have time to iron out the issues of whatever was going on here. I mean, remember, we have about 100 games that could have some weird graphical artifacting on PS5 when played through backwards compatibility and then there's still seven games that for whatever reason just don't work but we've seen some of those titles get patched out where it was a list of originally originally like 11 or 12 games um so it's not to say that sony's solution here is is bad i mean it's actually excellent but it's just you've got a situation of excellent versus um amazing right that's kind of what we're looking at here they both work really well but obviously one is coming out a little bit further on top especially with some great initiatives like the fps boost thing as well so uh, that's excellent, but it doesn't take away from the fact that Sony still has a good solution where it's the vast majority of software and it enhances the vast majority of PS4 software. So that's, that's not bad, right? I mean, this is why it's sometimes not really relevant to talk about on a per title basis unless we have a weird fringe case like say Biomutant where the developer was forward about what they had to do to get uh, good performance that's interesting but when we've got you know games coming out so often and you've got these what are oftentimes very minor differences uh it's it just becomes it goes right into that console war thing where people are scoreboarding like
like, oh, look at all this software here versus there. And sometimes that's regardless of the platform with the lead spec sheet, because we do have examples of some Series X games, whether they're native or not, um, having worse performance there versus PS5, because that's just game development sometimes. We've talked about it before. Um, sometimes the spec sheet is not a tell all. You have games that for whatever reason, just, um, work completely optimized on one platform versus the other or sometimes the SDK plays a major role there and that's why it's uh, sometimes exhausting to talk about it on a per title basis. Uh, although we have Digital Foundry if you're into that sort of thing and that, that's where I also feel bad for these guys sometimes because they spend hours recording all this footage just to tell people the honest results and then they're you know given flack for liking PS5 one day and then Xbox the next. It's just I don't know how people have the energy to do it all day. I really don't but this case in particular I thought was pretty noteworthy. For our next news story, this is more of a PSA in case you forgot, but how could you? Because Grand Theft Auto V is still launching on PlayStation 5, but we recently found out the release date, which was November 11th, so coming to PS5 at the end of this year, holiday season, and well, this is more particular to PS5 owners because if you remember back in June of 2020 for our first uh, PS5 live stream where we saw all that new software, the console itself, the first thing that we saw was Grand Theft Auto V, ironically, but we also found out that there was a deal with Sony. So when this game launches November 11th, PS5 owners will have access to GTA Online for free as a standalone separate piece of content that you can download. So you don't have to buy the standard copy of the game. You can just download GTA Online separately and play that for free for three months if you're on PlayStation 5. Moving on to our next news story, it has recently been noticed that over on Steam, the creator page for PlayStation Studios, which Sony would have because they've been publishing games on PC, if you check the About section, there's a catalog number of about 44 titles or DLC, and that's important to note here, that could include DLC because if you check what's publicly available in the Browse section, we know that there's six games that are available from Sony Publishing and 21 DLC items, which is mostly comprised of Helldivers and Predator Hunting Grounds DLC, but uh, this number technically would include DLC. Uh, but still, that is 17 games or DLC that is unaccounted for in the My Games section, and while we know that Sony's already been pretty forward about this, not only have they been for a long time slowly evaluating publishing on PC and trying to get more comfortable with it, but they just launched Days Gone, and before launching Days Gone, or actually when they announced Days Gone, they were pretty forward about how there is a slate of PlayStation software coming to PC, and, well, it looks like they might be gearing up for announcing more titles um, relatively soon, I would imagine. Um, now, it's just a matter of what that actually looks like. Um, now, a slate of games could imply that we will see a handful of titles, so even though this includes DLC, we might see a lot of games, actually. Um, Although I would imagine Sony wants to roll those out kind of like on a, you know, semi-monthly or quarterly basis, right? I don't think they want to just uh, announce four or five games coming out at any one time to not oversaturate there or kind of cannibalize sales of um, software against one another. But this is something where it's just a matter of what will those games actually look like? You know, are we talking about some of the big AAA stuff out of the PS4 back catalog or maybe some of the smaller stuff that would maybe uh, make more sense from a commercial point of view, right? So something like that, uh, something like Tearaway or maybe Concrete Genie, the Medieval remake. Um, you know, it could be stuff like that, Shadow of the Colossus remake. Because uh, it is still worth noting that Sony's not going to be shipping day and date, you know, PS5 games or very recently released PS5 games. Or um, I would even be hard pressed to see them do something like God of War or The Last of Us. I think those titles might be um, safeguarded if that makes any sense. But even then, I could still see them uh, doing it if they are comfortable enough. And it's like we've said before, some of these games have shipped their lifetime sales and they're not going to be moving another three, four, five million units. The company is going to be doing more PC releases and it's just a matter of when, not if. Next up in unsurprising news, if you didn't already catch this from a few months ago when Microsoft answered this in what was mostly black and white basically regarding this topic, uh, Games Beat reporter Jeff Grubb recently independently confirmed from his own sources that yes, Starfield is exclusive to Xbox and PC, there's no PS5 version, and that's why this is news from this past week, because he went out of his way to mention this in a tweet and then also post a story separately about it. Uh, so it seems like maybe there are still some conversations going on or people theorizing that yes, there is a PS5 version coming, but no, there isn't. And uh, I mean, you'll even remember too, when the acquisition was first announced, I was one of the people that thought, oh, okay, I could see them still doing uh, multi-platform releases for maybe some of these bigger titles that are gonna easily move 10, 15, 20 million copies. Um, 
but obviously that's not the case. I still feel as though they could have gotten away with it, but when Microsoft uh, had that little Bethesda roundtable, I mean, we got our answer basically, which is that currently existing and perhaps live service games will have a, a wide release and, you know, for pretty much anything else, it will ship on Game Pass, which, I mean, that's going to be Xbox hardware and PC, and then we know Microsoft would love to put Game Pass on a ton of devices, and I'm sure they're having a lot of those conversations behind the scenes, and they might not really have a whole lot of traction with uh, other platform holders, but the point is, um, that is the stipulation there, and I think the thing that we have to remember about this, and it's certainly one to consider for the conversation that I should have thought about at the time, but um, when we look at Microsoft's hardware right now, as good as Series S and X is on their own right in terms of just being a great overall usable platform, great performing games, it's still embarrassing, and in, and it's typical Microsoft fashion that it launched with zero first-party software, and there's still zero first-party software, and Halo Infinite got delayed. Um, which, by the way, for Starfield, we're hearing that's uh, potentially a 2022 release window, no particular um, release quarter or anything like that. But the thing is, the Bethesda acquisition was almost like, an, and I don't want to say a last-ditch effort, but it's just something where if you don't, that's, I know it irks people, right? Because Bethesda was a big publisher with a ton of developers that were always planning on shipping, you know, PS4 and PS5 games for the foreseeable future. And that's what's really annoying. People don't understand that difference of Sony, Nintendo, almost always fun projects from the very onset, whereas this is taking away, you know, a bunch of existing franchises and future titles away from uh, platforms that we're going to see those releases, right? That's why it's annoying to so many people. But this was an effort from Microsoft where despite them acquiring so many teams recently, these games are still not ready. And so what do you do? You use that Microsoft money, which the company has, right? The Xbox division has the financial backing of Microsoft and they can do something like this where, okay, we don't have first party software. Boom, we just nailed a ton of it from the get go, from the very onset. And that was their answer to the solution. So unsurprisingly, Starfield, uh, is going to be exclusive in all likelihood, right? Technically still a rumor, but I mean, it would be shocking otherwise if that wasn't the case. So uh, if you weren't, if you still had any sort of doubt, I mean, you should probably start understanding that that's what we're looking at moving forward. Now, another thing that got a lot of attention this past week, which was also not that surprising, or at least to me it wasn't, was the head of global third-party relations at PlayStation over on LinkedIn responding to Asad Kizilbash, where he was posting the quote we went over last week about uh, more than 25 games in development for PS5 from PlayStation Studios, nearly half of which are new IP. Uh, he responded saying, just wait until you see what's coming from our third-party partners too. This doesn't strike me as odd because, well, I think he's just kind of hinting towards all the great third-party stuff that is coming to all platforms, games that are unannounced. Uh, maybe, is there, maybe there's marketing tie-ins, maybe there's exclusive DLC, I mean, maybe timed exclusivity, but I mean, that doesn't really do much of anything. I mean, from Sony's point of view, it, it means more, right? But from the consumer's point of view, you're really not gaining much out of it or seeing much out of it. I mean, you could argue that um, as a, a PlayStation customer primarily playing on PlayStation, you obviously want the hardware to do well and exceed. And, you know, when you've got market share, you do uh, benefit from certain respects, right? But the thing is, I mean, well, I mean, timed exclusivity, I think the only reason why this really benefits Sony nowadays, which before it... If you had enough of it going on, then I think it would start to bug a lot of people and maybe that would have encouraged a hardware sale or something like that or a software sale that otherwise would have gone to the other guy. But um, I mean, I think maybe it's more useful, at least in this generation, if Sony's not going to be doing any sort of a proper Game Pass competitor in the short term uh, because we still don't know what that plan or counterpunch looks like if there is any um you know time exclusivity might be a little bit more useful right now it keeps that potential game pass day and date release away from the day one 60 70 ps5 release uh, so this actually might be one of the most viable strategies uh, for timed exclusivity that we've seen up to this point you know if enough of that keeps happening that's where sony might want to be they might be more encouraged to pursue something like that but even then as a consumer you don't gain much from playing on playstation and it just irks xbox customers so um not saying it's the right way to go not saying it's good just saying that's that might be how sony's approaching it but i really think there's not really there's not much here to look at other than yeah, there probably is more third-party deals coming, but that just comes with the territory. 
Moving on to our next news story, as I'm sure a lot of you are aware of at this point, we're very close to June, which means we are getting close to the E3 time frame. But not only that, also all these separate events and live streams that will be hosted on a per publisher basis throughout June and going into July. We know Microsoft is also going to be a part of E3, but Sony won't. And the one thing that we can mention here is that the Summer Game Fest hosted by Jeff Keighley, which will be June 10th, Sony will be a part of this particular show. Although I would temper expectations because this is one of those shows where there's a lot of partners involved. And yes, there will be world premieres and uh, a lot of trailers and things like that. But I would imagine Sony's going to either do something completely separate or have a, a small trailer here for an existing game. Maybe we'll get a new trailer. Who knows? I mean, we'll obviously watch it and uh, find out what happens there. But um, when it comes to Sony being involved and every other um, third party publisher, a part of this event, uh, they have their own separate events, so it stands to reason that they're not going to bring anything substantial or crazy to this uh, particular show. I'm sure they have a few surprises in there, but it's just something where watching Summer Game Fest, I wouldn't expect it to be a crazy E3 you know, timed show, right? Um, that's why, much like last year, we're going to see a lot of this stuff spread out throughout June and July. And that's why for Sony, we haven't really talked about this, but we don't really know what they're planning on doing uh, or if they're doing anything at all. I mean, they could just... Um do some separate state of play sprinkled throughout. They could do um, a long form live stream that has its own title outside of a state of play uh, name, right? I mean, that's kind of what I think a lot of us are expecting, but June and July will be a huge indicator of what we're expecting when it comes to Sony First Party and some of these titles that are still somehow slated for this year, right? I mean, we're going to have to get some sort of release date, schedule, update, and uh, new trailers if they're ready for a lot of this first-party software that we're, we're expecting, and even maybe some first-party stuff that we haven't seen just yet. For our next news story, we've got yet another very interesting and perhaps alarming patent coming out of Sony Interactive Entertainment. This one's called an eSports betting platform, and what this entails is essentially a way for your PlayStation or some sort of user interface to calculate odds based on wagers that you could place in game or while watching a game like esports for example if you're watching a match play out you could uh, place a bet on who's going to lose who's going to die next who's going to um, get hit next it could you could have these little micro wagers and uh, that's essentially what this patent is entailing essentially it's always calculating the number of odds and what would make sense for that particular wager in a in a virtual simulation essentially it's just one of those weird patents where it outlines it in, in a very particular way but it's one where we know that sony's getting very serious with uh with these sports so like acquiring having a, a stake in evo acquiring them um and doing all these uh, tournaments lately and getting close with uh, fighting games in particular. I mean, it's not it's not surprising to see them evaluate something like this. I don't think we'll see something like this, not anytime soon at least. Uh, it could be something as small and playful as what we see with uh, in-chat wagers on Twitch, or it could be something much more insidious like wagering real money and it being uh, very highly addictive uh, front-facing on PlayStation consoles. But... I don't think we'll get that answer anytime soon. Now, with all that said, it is time to get to Let's Talk Plus, the weekly Let's Talk PlayStation giveaway where one of you can win a $10 PSN code. I would like to congratulate this viewer right here. I'll be contacting you very soon via email or Twitter. If you would like to win a $10 PSN code, it's very easy. Follow the link down below. Supporting this channel a number of ways can gain you an entry. And I'll announce the winner next week because I'm trying to help pay for your games. Those are all the news stories that I want to talk about you all from this past week. Our Tuesday video was my Returnal Platinum playthrough. So much like we did with Cuphead and Astro's Playroom from, be from beginning to end, that's my entire playthrough of the game with the Platinum. Uh, there were some glitch trophies and RNG, but for the most part, I loved that game. And I knew from the very onset I wanted to film the entire thing, and that's what took two weeks to put that out, unfortunately. So sorry about that, but... Uh, go check that out if you haven't seen it just yet. And uh, this coming Tuesday, as always, another video that will probably be released on time this time, hopefully. Uh, but that's all I've got for you. So that concludes this week's episode of Let's Talk PlayStation. I'm Ryan Banecki. Thank you all so much for talking with me. And I will see you all next Friday.